Now this may appear a little complex, but let's get it started. This is kind of like, how the heck does that even happen type event? Now it may not seem like much currently in the beginning, but however, as your brain begins to go over it over it a couple of times, so to say, you're wondering how. All right, many of you are familiar with the scenario in reference to say, well, if you were infected with COVID and then you received a vaccination, you have even a stronger immune response than those who were vaccinated and obviously never were infected with COVID prior. But there's one issue here which really has got me. Here we go. You ready? Previously infected individuals who received one dose of the vaccine had much higher immunoglobulin G antibody levels than fully vaccinated workers who were never infected. All right, so they were infected prior and then they had the shot. Now let's just change the timing of the infection. However, infection after the first dose and before the second did not increase immunoglobulin G levels. So in perspective, if you were infected and then you were vaccinated, your immunoglobulin G levels or antibodies help fight off SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, whatever, were much higher. But if you were vaccinated once in a two dose vaccine, and then you were infected, your immunoglobulin G levels did not increase Let's proceed. In individuals infected after the first dose, who never received the second dose, had similar antibody levels to those who received one dose and were never infected. I know it sounds superfluous, but when you start asking questions and dwelling on it more and more, it begins to gain an importance. And let's finish off the paragraph. Individuals in the cohort, 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 infected post-vaccination had immunoglobulin G antibody levels at 21 and 50 days, similar to those never infected, who received the same number of doses and much lower than those infected pre-vaccination. So what is that implying? You get the shot, then you get infected, and what happens? So you see what I mean? The infection doesn't give you the same benefit as if you were infected before, and then you had the vaccine. But if you get the shot, and then you're infected, you don't get the advantage of having the prior infection. It comes together, but it's really weird. How does that even happen? I'd really, 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 really be appreciative if any immunologists uh, can chime in on that because that is bizarre. But as usual, good evening to our data analysts, data scientists, biostatisticians, bioinformatics, epidemiologists, and medical professionals, as well as policymakers. It is now 11.57 p.m., about to turn 12 a.m., my normal time, so a little early. All right, tonight, what we shall cover is as follows. We covered this real fast, so we'll go back. We're going to be looking at Specific UV light wavelength could offer low cost, safe way to curb COVID-19 spread. We are going to be reviewing study questions, popular COVID test. This is really, really, really groundbreaking because a lot of asymptomatic individuals who are infected with COVID-19 don't show that they were infected with COVID-19 because the tests may be testing for the wrong element. And so there may be, may, may be a much higher uh, infection level inside the community as opposed to before because the tests that we do or have been doing have been failing to detect prior infection in asymptomatic individuals. All right, proceed. Natural Infection versus vaccination, differences in COVID antibody responses emerge. Again, incredible because the fund, the natural infection has a much broader spectrum of protection. 
uh, in reference to certain elements, even though uh, vaccination may give you a quick boost. A long term, at least according to this research here, natural infection seems to uh, rule the day. Then again, American Journal of Medicine commentary on COVID-19 vaccines, and it should be short up with plant-based diets. If you're into the inoculation or vaccination um, paradigm, then what they're recommending is plant-based diets in association with the vaccinations yield you a higher opportunity for the vaccination to get greater results as well as reduce the likelihood of um, other issues or negative outcomes. The impact of oral health. All right, this is going to tie into basically this one right here. Uh, the gut bacterial dysbiosis and instability associated with the onset of complications of mortality in COVID-19. Uh, Fecalibacterium. Fecalibacterium is really, 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 really beginning to become a rising star in reference to any of the positive bacteria in the microbiome itself. This is probably the fifth or sixth after we've done this about a year. Uh, research article where Fecalibacterium has shown amazing correlations in reference to a positive COVID-19 outcomes in regard to infection. Now, parabacterioids uh, are in the, being the true villain. And when we go into this research real fast, they could draw some really strong correlations uh, between parabacterioids bacterioids, parabacterioids, and having a negative outcome, and in fact, calibacterium having a positive outcome. And we'll look at that in a second, as well as to acute myocarditis. We'll look at this as well uh, from the Journal of American Medical Association that we're part about. It's not the number of vaccinations. Now, the outcome in myocarditis turned out to be much higher after the second dose. The first dose, yeah, you probably pretty light or rare. The second dose, the, you'll see the authors from the Journal of American Medical Association, quote, worthy of greater investigations. And then, of course, we looked at right here, uh, in reference to the second vaccine needed for individuals infected with COVID-19 shortly after the first dose. So we'll read through that in a second. Uh, disclaimer before I begin, da 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 we, they from VAERS, as we look at the uh, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, while very important monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, and unverifiable. Uh, data sources as well, be using our world and data. Real, oh, look at this real briefly. All right, this, let's look at this. Our world and data, one of the best data sources out there. By far, but check this out. Ready, real fast. People fully vaccinated, United States and Australia. All right. Then we look at the uh, confirmed deaths. Just giving you a correlation. So here we go. United States, Australia, Egypt, and India. All right. Even though, for example, the vaccine rates. I know people are going to say, "Well, the reporting may be off." Whatever it is, I don't know about that. Uh, so here we go, people vaccinated, Australia, United States, India, and Egypt. Egypt has less than, what, eight, six percent of the population vaccinated, India, fully vaccinated, India is up close to 20. And then, so confirmed cases, United States, Australia is like maniacal, totalitarian government right now as far as locking down everybody. India and Egypt is kind of like, eh, whatever. And then, uh, and then United States, of course, is somewhere in between. But look at the uh, confirmed cases per million, as you see right there, Egypt 7.5, India 14.79, Australia 86.22, United States 288.12, compared to the fully vaccinated rate, right over da, 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 here. Again, I'm big into correlations. Doesn't mean there's none of the confounding, but let's get that one out of the way. That's what we're using. We're using uh, our world and data, one of the best data sources out there, and that's just what it shows. Whatever conclusion you want to draw from that, go for it. All right, and then I think that is it as well as up GSI AIDS. 
as far as our basically our pathogens of variants of concern. And as we look at that on the data analysis, we look at the data itself. Uh, oh, that, that. Uh, close that out. That's the pre recording there. Uh, we're going to be looking at the mutations and really uh, overall uh, Delta pretty much rules the day, but we'll get back into that in a second. Let's begin with the news articles to start with. Ba -ba -ba. Oh, also too, we'll be using your, your vigilance and uh, same disclaimers, fairs. Again, the reports coming in are just, um, they need to be investigated. Uh, a lot of them be from individuals, a lot of them healthcare workers and so forth. They're safety signals. So uh, until some sort of um, conclusion is reached, I don't know. And let's get that away real fast. Since I showed you that real right off the bat, look to see the zip file size, 2021, 235 megabytes for the vaccine adverse event reporting system for 2021 compared to 11.2 for 2020. And if we want to get a good look at that as far as comparison overall, doo -doo -doo, there's 2021, there's 2020. And how does that compare over 30 years compared to January 1st of 2021 to October 10th, just turned that time. Uh, looks like this. This is all the vaccine adverse event reports uh, data in reference to megabyte size at 135.43 over about the past 10 months. We'll give you the, the benefit of the doubt. This right here, 122.53 megabytes of all the information compiled over every single reaction or that has been reported to VAERS from 1990 to 2020. 30 years worth of uh, data compared to 10 months worth of data uh, in reference to just this year, 2021. So you can see how incredible the spectrum of, I mean, the mass amount of information coming to the CDC. Uh, no one's answered the question yet regard, in regard to, does the CDC have the personnel to filter through all this barrage of data that is just basically um, coming across its desk? But let us proceed with the refer, uh, information, research information to start. Again, it's midnight and it always has, appears to have speech challenged. Let us begin. All right, specific UV lightweight, light wavelength could offer low cost safe, safe way to curb COVID-19 spread. You know how long I've been pushing for UV light to be utilized in public arenas uh, because of how incredibly effective it is as far as uh, pandemic mitigation uh, methods go, especially when masks uh, could be in question, barriers can be in question, distance can be questioned, and so on and so forth. The ventilation is a win. But however, though, let's look at what the researchers came up with, and it's incredible. Now, keep in mind, UV222, as we proceed into this, UV222 lights are available. They are just expensive. If any of the researchers out there know of a far UVC, UV222 nanometer light wave we're about to discuss, that is not, does not cost an arm and a leg, please post it. Let us begin. Specific UV light wavelength could offer low cost, safe way to curb COVID-19 spread. A game changer. And it has been for a while. For UV light use could lead to new affordable, safe and highly effective systems for reducing viral spread in crowded public places like airports and concert venues, restaurants, you name it. Of almost every pathogen we've ever studied, this virus is one of the easiest by far to kill with UV light. They use the word kill, I didn't. A lot of immunologists will split hairs, reference to inactivation, kill, you know, whatever. I'm just quoting, but here it goes. This virus is one of the easiest by far to inactivate with UV light. Again, a lot of you not familiar, there's gonna be the question whether a virus is alive or not, and that debate's been going on for a long time period of time, so I'll, I'll word it in both elements. Said the lead author, says that this indicates that UV technology could be a really good solution for protecting public spaces. Proceed. Some common products like fluorescent tube lamps use human engineered UV light, but with a white phosphorus coating on the inside that protects people from the UV rays. 
All right. Uh, so when we take that coating off, we can emit those wavelengths. And that can be harmful for our skin and eyes, especially UVC 254. Now, I use in many of my facilities, I'll use UVC 254, but only when people are not there. And I use that to disinfect cardboard, other formite, other, other surfaces, and so on and so forth. But when people aren't there, you can get tons of UVC 254 uh, nanometer wavelength lights all everywhere, mail order, but they're not healthy uh, in the presence of people or any living organism per se. But to proceed, death by exposure. The researchers found while the virus is quite susceptible to UV light in general, a specific wavelength of far ultraviolet C at 22 nanometers was particularly effective, created by what's known as a krypton chloride excimer, excimer lamp fueled by molecules moving between different states of energy. This wavelength is very high energy, therefore it is able to inflict greater viral protein and nucleic acid damage to the virus compared to other UVC devices, as well as, we discussed this I think about four months ago too, be blocked by the very top layers of the human skin and eyes, meaning that it is limited to no detrimental health effects at doses that are capable of killing off inactivating off viruses. Not only is it safe, it is also the most effective. As early as the 1940s, it was the backstory, it was used to reduce transmission of tuberculosis in hospitals and classrooms. Classrooms, wow, what a novel idea. By shining the light at the ceiling to disinfect air as it circulated through the, throughout the room. Man, have uh, to proceed. Linden researcher imagined systems that could either cycle on and off in outdoor spaces to routinely clean the air on the surfaces. That's what I do with one of my locations. I use the 254 comes on. I have you know a lot of cardboard in the area, and but I do it at, at uh, two or three in the morning. It comes on, stays on for about an hour or so, and then it goes off before people come in. Or create an ongoing invisible barrier between teachers and students. Customers and service workers. You can see how that could work real well with UVC 222. And people in spaces where social distancing is not possible to disinfect the air. UV light disinfection can even rival the positive effects of improved indoor ventilation, providing the equipment protection of increased air changes per hour within a room. It is also much cheaper to install UV lights and to upgrade an entire HVAC system. Again, Many of you are going to be looking for UVC 22 lights. If anybody can find any below $1,000, please feel free to post it. There is an opportunity here to save money and energy while protecting public health in the same way. It's real exciting. I would have really have liked a lot of our bureaucratic um, establishments, I'm about to say know-it-alls, but that would have been inappropriate. If that would have been utilized, uh, imagine, in classrooms or public arenas or public meeting areas, uh, to, to not be so draconian. I mean, come on. By the thought, I mean, they were still using masks and barriers and distancing. And even if the facilities which I utilized, we were doing ozonation, isonation, UV light and ventilation. They're using barriers, masks and distancing, ozonation, isonation, UV light and ventilation, what we were using months and months and months and months ago. Well, they have to catch up uh, to the 1940s. All right, to proceed to the next one. Study questions, popular COVID test. This is vital. This is truly, truly a game changer more than anything else. Few of you out there may uh, get an idea of the estimation of how profound this truly is if this is validated. To proceed as follows. Blood tests for detecting prior infection with the coronavirus rely on antibodies called immunoglobulin Gs. Immunoglobulin Gs are popping up all through all the research we're doing tonight, it seems. Immunoglobulin Gs usually develop a few weeks after infection and come in multiple varieties, depending on which part of the virus they attach to. Two, com two common kinds are the antibodies targeting the nucleo uh, nucleocapsid protein in the receptor binding domain. Remember when we looked at vaccine 
proteins uh, which work to target the RBD as opposed to the spike protein. And that was like about a year ago. And I haven't seen any RBD vaccines come out uh, as yet, but still they found, they said if they would have done that a year ago, as opposed to looking at the spike protein, then variants uh, would have not made much of a difference in reference to the, um, the vaccination potency or effectiveness, so to say, of RBD, of the spike protein of the coronavirus. So again, nucleocapsid and receptor binding protein. You have the two venues there. The recent Russian US study reports that levels of these two antibodies in patients at various times following recovery from COVID-19. It accounts for mild and asymptomatic cases as well as serious ones. Our main finding is that asymptomatic COVID-19 patients often have no immunoglobulin G antibodies to an internal component of the virus known as the nucleo nucleocapsid protein. Yet, here it goes. Tests detecting that very kind of antibodies are often recommended to check whether someone has had COVID-19. You see the conundrum. So the person had asymptomatic COVID-19 and they're testing for the nuclear the nucleocapsid protein, but or the immunoglobulin G, so I should say, to the nucleocapsid protein. But they don't have any immunoglobulin Gs, but yet they had COVID-19. So let us proceed. So imagine, imagine if you're doing a, a trial, you're trying to, uh, to uh, how do you test the effectiveness of a vaccine, but you're unwittingly incorporating individuals which you assume were not infected with COVID-19 prior into your vaccine trial. See the other perplexing scenario to proceed. Uh, but regardless of disease severity, Every patient we tested but one exhibited immunoglobulin G antibodies to, what was it? The receptor binding domain, the RBD of the spike protein, which is located on the surface of the viral particle. Here's where it gets interesting. The team hypothesizes that if a patient is having an asymptomatic case of COVID, their immunity must have done such a great job warding off the infection early on that the virus did not really have a chance to enter the phase of active reproduction. So we have a system out there where we love to do COVID-19 tests and things like that. And people may have been infected prior, but their immune systems are so efficient that it's not showing that they had COVID-19, but they had COVID-19 because we unwittingly, as a society, are testing for the nuclear nucleocapsid protein immunoglobulin Gs and not the receptor binding domain, or RBDs, because we're learning to proceed. It says, but as long as the virus does not penetrate into the cells, only antibodies to RBD are produced. So massive immune system, boom, never got to the nucleocapsid, but RBD uh, antibodies are there, but they had it, but we test and they don't, to reiterate since they are the ones targeting the virus's exterior. Intriguingly, ready for this? The team found RBD levels not just to persist, but exhibit an average increase in the sample studied, according to the researchers. While this finding may seem to contradict some earlier studies that reported that concentrations of antibodies to RBD falling with time. This may actually depend on what the patients in the respective samples have been up to following the recovery. So they're saying basically, hey, we found out it's actually going up. We don't know what the heck you guys did. There must be some sort of confounding in your study because it's not what we found. You see what I mean? It seems reasonable to expect that a patient who has recovered from COVID-19 will experience a surge of antibodies when re-exposed to the pathogen. Quoting, I mean, that's how immunity works. It is not some kind of protective bubble you carry around. It is rather the potential to fight back against the virus effectively should it find its way into the body again. Whether it does and how often might affect the subsequent dynamics of the antibody count, quote, end quote, from the researcher. Again, the links to the research will be there for you to follow, at least the article here as well. Uh, it's the whole night tonight. We have a few research articles, but it's all going to 
be along the same lines. Let's proceed to the next one. You ready? Here we go. Natural infection versus vaccinations. There is a difference. Here we go. This is like this whole last week, a lot of groundbreaking research came out and none of it really made the news because we're, we're going this ebb and flow of reference to, you know, infection rates going down and so on and so forth. And people are just getting burnt out. But yet a lot of lockdown measures are still in place and not going away. Now, natural infection versus vaccination. Difference in COVID antibody responses emerge. Hope for a future without fear of COVID comes down to circulating antibodies in memory B cells. Unlike circling and circling, circulating antibodies, which peak soon after vaccination or infection, only, fit, only to fade a few months later. Memory B cells can stick around to prevent severe disease for decades. How long? We're not saying months. Decades. <laughs> and they evolve over time. Learning to produce successfully more potent memory antibodies that are better at neutralizing the virus and more capable of adapting to variants. Vaccination produces greater amounts of circulating antibody. Here's the difference. You ready? Here we go. Vaccination produces greater amounts of circulating antibodies in natural infection. Antibodies to what though? Nuclear capsid or receptor binding domain? See, that's how it leads in, but to proceed. But a new study suggests that not all memory B cells are created equal. While vaccination gives rise to memory B cells that evolve over a few weeks, natural infection births memory B cells that continue to evolve over seven months, producing highly potent antibodies adept at eliminating even viral variants. These findings highlight an advantage bestowed by natural infection rather than vaccination. And to be fair, the authors are saying, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, natural infection, yeah, one thing, but, but does it outweigh the risk of disability and death from COVID-19? So they're saying, as we discussed last week, you, you can get infected, but you want to risk disability or death from COVID-19. But once you, but if you survive, voila, natural infection rather than vaccination has advantages bestowed to it. All right, here we go. Vaccination, natural infection, elicits similar numbers of B cells. Memory B cells rapidly evolve between the first and second dose of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, producing interestingly potent memory antibodies. Interestingly potent, increasingly, increasingly. But after two months, progress stalled. The memory B cells were present in large numbers and expressed potent antibodies, but the antibodies were not getting any stronger. Also, though some of those is interesting because you know a lot of those vaccine trials only went two months. Somebody, either that's a weird correlation. That's all I'm going to say. Also, although some of those an these antibodies were able to neutralize Delta and other variants, there was no over impro overall improvement in the breath. While convalescent patients, on the other hand, memory B cells continue to evolve and improve up to one year after infection. More potent and more broadly neutralized memory antibodies were coming out with every memory B cell update. There are several potential reasons for that memory B cells produced by natural infection might be expected to outperform those produced by mRNA vaccines. It is possible that the body responds differently to viruses that enter through the respiratory tract than those that are injected into our upper arms. Or perhaps an intact virus goads the immune system in a way that the lone spike protein represented by the vaccine simply cannot. Then again, maybe it's the virus persistent and naturally infected for weeks, giving the body more time to mount robust response. The vaccine, on the other hand, is flushed out of the body mere days after triggering the desired immune response. Can I add any more publisher bias in the inflection of my voice? Here it goes, ready? The vaccine, on the other hand, is flushed out of the body mere days after triggering the desired immune response. When to administer the booster depends on the object of boosting. If the goal is to prevent infection, then boosting will need to be done after six to 18 months, depending on the immune status of the individual. If the goal is to prevent serious disease, if the goal is to prevent serious disease, boosting may not be necessary for years. Take from it what you want, but quite interesting. Default back to this test. So, Many of you may have had COVID. You may have been asymptomatic. You could be tested. It shows you haven't had COVID. 
but maybe you did. In which case, your natural immunity is going to be pretty darn good. But with the current tests, it's not going to show you were exposed. If they upgrade the test to the basically the receptor binding protein domain or receptor ba, you know, receptor RBD, receptor binding domain, that's what I'm trying to say. Please forgive my speech there. Uh, maybe, again, maybe we have, we already have tons of people who are exposed. Uh, it's all going to depend, I guess, on the hospitalization, the beds, and so on and so forth. But they also run a role, and we're going to go into the next story of dysbiosis. So you can have a confounding factor where we've been so separated for so long, masked up, and all this other stuff, and you have dysbiosis. And that's where the problem begins. Now, think about it. Dysbiosis, what happens? You have a wrapping over your mouth. And the wrapping over your mouth deprives you basically your oral cavity of potentially positive or, you know, environmental bacteria, which all of a sudden you don't get, which then affects uh, your oral health. But let's go to the next one, then we'll come to that one second. American Journal of Medicine commented COVID-19 vaccine should be shored up with a plant-based diet. The authors point to a new study of healthcare workers whose immune system to the Pfizer vaccine was inversely associated with waist, waist circumference. A 2021 study of healthcare workers in 600 what, what just happened here? Up oh, went to the wrong thing. That was that's the full study. But here we go back. It says wait a, second, a study of healthcare workers in six countries revealed that those following large plant based diets had seventy three percent lower odds of developing monitored severe COVID nineteen compared to those on other diets. Seventy three percent lower odds of developing monitored severe COVID nineteen. That is incredible. To make an immunization program work, which you probably wouldn't need it if everyone was eating like that, but to proceed, to make an immunization program work, convincing people to roll up their sleeves for initial immunization and boosters as necessary is one key step. Improving their ability to respond to the vaccine is another. Evidence strongly suggests that urgently addressing underlying health conditions with, for starters, a healthier diet would not only reduce the likelihood of severe infection and death over time, but it also may help vaccines to work better. The, that's the whole thing. You, when they did lockdowns and everything else like that, you, I mean, many of you, if you have to get to drive by McDonald's or Jack in the Box or Taco Bell or any of the other popular fast food establishments, and you just see lines of cars. Because our diets generally did not become better in reference to pandemic lockdowns and so on and so forth. Our diets became quite challenged, as results show. But to proceed, now we go back to dysbiosis. Dysbiosis and oral health and diet plays a role too. Now, this may seem, eh, it's kind of a boring research article, but they all begin to tie in. Here we go. Several trials have correlated poor oral hygiene with hyperinflammation. Similarly, COVID-19 Severity has been linked to hyperinflammatory responses. Hence, in this study, we assume that the increased COVID-19 severity may be linked to poor oral health status. This was achieved through assessing oral health status severity of COVID-19 symptoms, C-reactive protein levels for the duration of recovery. Results. The correlation between oral health and COVID-19 severity showed a significant inverse correlation. Moreover, the correlation between oral health with recovery period and C-reactive protein values also revealed a significant inverse correlation showing that's 0.001 unless there's some massive uh, massive confounding in there that's pretty that's i mean that's pretty amazing showing that poor oral health was correlated to increase c-reactive protein and delayed recovery period and the conclusion we already know and let's go down here i just want to show you da, 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 da. this is this is how strong which right here you guys check this out poor oral health severity fair oral health Good oral health, oral health, mild, good oral health, fair oral health, poor oral, poor oral, oral health. Meaning, if you have poor oral health, you're more likely to have severe COVID-19 than mild COVID-19. You get where it's going? If you have good oral health, you're less likely to have severe COVID-19 as opposed to mild COVID-19. Pretty solid 
correlation. Let's back up here once again. Check this out. And if you look at here, I know these charts are maybe a little uh, confounding which to read, but the severity, again, you see this big chart there and people say, oh, maybe it needs more severity. No, that means the overall health status, it's mild, serious. See, people with good oral health, less likely to have serious. People with poor oral health, that give you a, a pretty good understanding as far as how strongly correlated it is. Good oral health uh, as far as recovery. Look at that. You see there. And it go, well, a C-reactive protein. Low levels of C-reactive protein. Good to fair oral, oral health. And, you know, bad oral health, high C-reactive protein. Again, correlation is not causative. But, however, though, that's pretty convincing. And go down the line here. And that's discussion. I think we that was that pretty much speaks for itself. Now, here we go to Fecalibacterium. Pay attention to this one. It's real intriguing. It says, quote, let's make this a little larger because it takes sometimes a few days to process the 4K. Results. We found the gut and oral microbiota to be altered depending on the number and type of COVID-19-associated complications and disease, disease severity. The occurrences of individual complications was correlated with low risk. Fecalibacterium, and I did not pan practice the pronunciation of prosenitsi, prosen, prosenitsi and high risk bacteria, parabacterioids. We demonstrate that a stable gut bacterium con con composition was associated with favorable disease progression. And they could determine how bad the disease is going to be depending on the micro, uh, microbiome uh, profile. And I'll show you that in a second. Let's see. Let's first bring up the chart real fast. I'm going to carry this over here. Da, da, da. There. And this, gives, let's, let's move this up just in case I didn't miss anything. I think right here, gastrointestinal symptoms in patients with COVID-19 are associated with increased disease severity and complications and an exaggerated immune response to the virus considered to play a crucial role in driving disease progression. It is well known that gut microorganisms influence uh, systemic immune response of their host through multiple crosstalk and immune cells. All right, we know. But let's just go straight to, cut straight to the chase because this is the bacteria profile that you're looking for. Oh, here it goes again, too. Parabacterioids was increased in patients with uh, respiratory distress and hemodialysis and related mortality. Acute respiratory distress. Their associations of individual bacteria with the occurrence of complications suggest a potential role of the gut microbiota in the development of specific complications within COVID-19 and provide additional evidence for an involvement of the gut concerning cardiovascular risk in venous thromb uh, thrombolism. Uh, you, you get the point. But now people want to know, well, what? what? What is the good? What's bad? And that we discussed before. This is a great chart. Again, the links will be there uh, that they presented. And it's going to have to go all the way down. You think you're done, but you're really up. Let me close that out real fast. But you're really not. Ah, don't worry about that. There is that. Ta da. All right, here it goes. Beautiful graphics. Look really cool. And then, of course, it breaks up the, uh, the different types there. And But this is the main thing. I want to bring you down to this one. Do, 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 do. There's your Fecalibacterium. That's going to be a rising star. Here, right here. The significant differences between complications. Can we make this bigger? Let's make it really big there. There it is. Check this out. All right. So here's Fecalibacterium. All right. So acute respiratory distress. Now, you see this green thing? It means no. So the higher the levels of Fecalibacterium, the less likely acute respiratory distress. AKI, hemodialysis, you know, cardiac events, mortality, and so on. Well, let me just pick, look at these two. Cardiac events and mortality. And now, the villain, parabacterioids. See the inverse? Acute respiratory distress, right here. And then hemodialysis. And then we go down here, mortality. And you can see that Cilobacter, same thing. Uh, the E. coli, same thing. 
This guy's a pretty cool too. Bladia, Blashia, Archimancia. This is another rising star too. It didn't really perform that well in reference to COVID-19, but that's as good for a lot of other things uh, that would be researched as well right now. But look at that. That gut microbiome plays such a huge role. And if this is being tested and this comes out high, then we know there's a, a pretty good potential going for a negative outcome. And remember too, we looked at last week, some of the beneficial bacteria completely vanish. And that's a uh, conundrum as well. But again, really, really good research. The links will be there for you to follow and grab that as a reference point as well. All right, now, acute myocarditis. We're looking at the Journal of American Medical Association. I'm just going to read through it real fast and make it a little larger. And so acute myocarditis following COVID-19 mRNA vaccination in adults age 18 or older. This is different. Now, I can't remember, we're not looking at 18 and younger. We're looking at 18 and o or older. But here we go. You're ready for this. It goes as follows. Of patients with myocarditis post-vaccination, none had a prior, this is the study group, none had a prior cardiac disease. Eight patients received you know, this particular vaccine and seven received the other one. All were hospitalized and tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 by polymerase chain reaction on admission. Fourteen reported chest pain uh, between one to five days after the vaccination. Symptoms resolved with conservative management. In all cases, no patients required intensive care, admission, or remission of discharge. In this population cohort study of that many individuals, 2,392,924 individuals who received at least one dose of COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, acute myocarditis was rare. All right. Acute myocarditis was rare at an incidence of 5.8 cases per million individuals after the second dose, one case per 172,414 fully vaccinated individuals. All right, let's read that real close because, again, there should have been a comma there. Yeah, let me read that properly. So I basically wanted to show you the chart. It's better. So by rare, that's what looking at rare. Can you see right here? Ah, right there. See, it says two. And then at the second dose, you go into 13. So that's what they meant by those 5.8. You see right there, 0. 0.8 to 5.8. That's what they were implying. So that gives you a better idea. I was trying to figure out how it could work. I wasn't even ordering it proper in the comma there. So basically, that's what it came down to be. So it went from rare to increase after that second dose. So 5.8 cases per million individuals after the second dose. So I'll, it, the comma was not a, a proper placement. But however, though, you get the point from the figure right there. And so if you look at the first dose, once again, right here, you're looking at 0.8. You're looking at, at the second dose, it jumps to 5.8, which increases that incident ratio. All right, and then we go to the next grouping right here. Ba, ba, ba. Second vaccine dose needed for individuals infected with COVID-19 shortly after the first dose. A second dose of COVID-19 vaccine should be offered to individuals infected with the virus shortly after receiving the first dose. According to findings recently published by the, basically, as really, Faculty of Medicine, you get the idea. All right. And this is the interesting part. I want to read you this one more time because it's intriguing on what happens. Previously infected individuals received one dose of the vaccine and a much higher immunoglobulin G, there it is again, antibody levels than fully vaccinated workers who were never infected. So prior to vaccination, they get vaccinated, their immunoglobulin G levels are higher than individuals that were never infected. However, infection after the first dose so they get the shot, and then they get infected. And before the second, did not increase immunoglobulin G levels. And individuals infected after the first dose who never received the second had similar antibody levels to those who received one dose and were never infected. Individuals in the cohort infected post-vaccination and immunoglobulin G antibody levels at 21 and 50 days similar to those never infected who received the same number of doses and much lower than those infected pre-vaccination. So again, it's interesting because 
how can hemoglobin G levels not move that much if you get infected after the first dose, but if you're infected prior to the vaccine and then you get shot, your hemoglobin G levels or antibody levels are good and they're getting stronger. But if you get infected after the vaccine and it's diff- they're like not really moving, intriguing. All right, but let's get right into the data analysis as follows. I'm going to go right to the VAERS uh, disclaimer as we did before. Very important that the uh, determined vaccine contributed to an adverse event or illness. Reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. All right, and that's why it's up to the CDC to verify it eventually. And let's get right into the data. Here we go. Ba-ba-ba. That's the zip file size. We went through right off the bat. Let's go into the VAERS data itself. Where are we looking at? If we break it down to all the reactions, remove duplicates, we have reported two VAERS as of, actually it's October 1st, but I put today's date for convenience. 596,612. 596,612 reports have been submitted to VAERS. And of course in our database, we removed all duplicates, so on and so forth. And we are gonna go down, these are the charts per se, um, paralysis, um, thrombocytopenia, so Bell's palsy, so far and so forth. I want to stop for a second. We want to read something like that. You, you, it's perfectly welcome to because it's being 4K, so hopefully it's legible for you. And uh, so as we go down, I'm just going to go first for the expediency of time. I'm going to go to our uh, basically um, gathering information. And again, for the data analysts out there, uh, by the way, also too, just for those which are breaking down the data frames, just to play it real safe, uh, you want to start adding low memory false when you start importing data from VARES because they will have mixed data types in some of the columns and that will slow your systems down dramatically in reference to data data harvesting. Shingles reactions, obviously on the rise, but let's just go down to the synopsis uh, data-wise. Let's go down here. Duplicated VARES IDs, so this, again, something like that. You have to be, you have to basically take those duplicates out. Uh, symptom tax, so on and so forth. Da da da. It's going down. Reported mortality to VARES now resting at seven thousand four hundred and twenty-one. Need to be confirmed. Uh, mortality per week as it goes up and down. Doesn't seem to change even though vaccine levels may go down. Last week was pretty low. Um, mortality reported to VAERS throughout the days. Let's just go straight down. Continuing, continuing, continuing. Vaccine reactions. Remember, I showed you the vaccine reaction uh, zip file size compared to the all the years prior. But we look at the vaccine reactions reported to VAERS this year so far compared to all of 2020 uh, pales in comparison. Again, 596,612 reactions reported so far this year to VAERS versus 57,115. And I'm still waiting for a report to see if CDC has enough personnel to um, go through all of those reports and look for those safety signals. Uh, seems pretty important. You want to read a lot of the, um, the symptom text as far as basically what may have occurred in individuals. You could see right there if you could read that. These are not reports which are just like written and just submitted with um, with um, in a carefree manner. You can get a drift from the, um, the reporting IDs of each one of what occurred, especially young individuals. Let's go down. Scroll down, scroll down. Uh, this is basically it's make, start making this a little smaller. And uh, this is, is the word cloud of the most common reactions reported. The top 30 reported symptoms of all ages. Confusional states begin to pop there, there, but primarily headache, dizziness, fatigue, chest pain, number four, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, then we continue. And I'm reading this real fast because yeah, see what, for example, you see a duplicate report occurring. No, no, that's not a duplicate report. That is basically um, uh, a submitted report three times. I see what they're doing. All right, proceed. 
uh, cardiac arrest, the key respiratory deaths, but these are the reactions of individuals which have passed on. The top 30 reactions are those uh, mortality. It seems like COVID-19 breakthroughs seem to be the highest than cardiac arrest, which ironically is the fourth uh, report in reference to symptoms of all ages here, chest pain. And then you have, have cardiac arrest. Interesting. COVID-19 pneumonia, uh, COVID-19. So COVID-19, you see the breakthrough cases? Now, think about this. You have insight into the research, which shows if you're infected after the first shot, between shots, that your immunoglobulin G levels don't move. And so now you begin to get that question, is it a vaccine reaction or some sort of other form of immunocompromise to proceed? All right. Then this is the COVID vaccine reaction reports by age. You begin to see some really low uh, ages there. I don't know why they're popping up, but you get an idea. Minors. And then lot numbers as far as what's most associated with most reports. Doesn't mean anything because those lots could be larger than others, so I need to actually have percentages here. I'll get to that eventually. Uh, children, most common reactions in children. Let me load, make the screen a little smaller again. Maybe bounce around for a second. There it is. Uh, that's what they're saying. This is in the reports. This is what comes out. Not me making this word chart one word bigger than another. With word clouds, the more often a word is mentioned, the larger that word is presented to you in a word cloud. And so, yeah, these are probably your top. Top reported symptoms in children, headache, dizziness, fatigue, chest pain. Again, number four, even with the all ages. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, proceed. Down the line. Da, 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 da. Let's see if we got anything else here. Oh, yeah, we want to go to the synopsis. And I should have this next week. I'm going to add a few more uh, uh, vaccine reactions of interest. COVID-19 seems to be the biggest one. Shingles, uh, thrombosis, mortality, Bell's palsy, myocarditis, paralysis, which I could see a little bit of a grouping here with Bell's palsy, serva, which is the shoulder injuries from the injections, uh, thrombocytopenia. And uh, there's thrombosis there. I'll add a few more a little bit later on as they're coming up. As far as I'll, I'll get it harmonized with the European database, which we'll go to now. Uh, so basically, the European database, here we are. Serious reports. Now, this is just the serious ones, not all of them. Now, they're a little different. Let's look at, now, that's interesting because of where COVID is on theirs. Now, these serious Serious reports are ones that require hospitalization due to your during diligence, but again, same disclaimer. These reports being submitted, they have to be validated by the medical authorities there. Uh, joint pain and so on and so forth, chills, fatigue. Uh, you get an idea, myalgia, deep vein thrombosis, heavy menstrual bleeding, lymphadenia, back pain, uh, ab 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 abdominal pain, influence like illness, you know, all the way down to nausea which you think would be higher, but no. But total reactions, we have, this is a little bit brighter if you want to read that way. Total reactions on the, uh, that's a word cloud, on the Endura Vigilance. This is weird. All right, now, now I'm, I'm counting 12,045 on the fatality rate. Last week was 15,000, then it dropped down to 11,000, then it went back up. Now we're at 12,000. So I don't know why the fatal designation keeps on bouncing around. Uh, but there we are there. Uh, total vaccine reports to endure vigilance is now at 1,038,776. It's the European database. So AstraZeneca, we're looking at there. Uh, Pfizer, we're looking at 485,023 reactions. Uh, Moderna, one uh, reported to endure vigilance. Uh, reaction reported on the Moderna vaccine, 132,122. The Janssen and Janssen, commonly known as Johnson and Johnson, 30,712. And, and looks like they are masking up to 609,413 series events. So, so the interesting part about that, almost about half of the reports 
Trader Dur Vid Dur Vigilance, uh, Vigilance, actually more than half, significantly, um, are serious. We're usually requiring hospitalization. And there's Pfizer, uh, 249,104. Moderna, 132,120. Uh, AstraZeneca, 196,668. Janssen & Janssen, 30,711. Uh, interesting as far as what's popping up. And so you, you get in a, a good idea of what's going on. So that's interesting as far as the combination there. These teams are weird because they seem to pop up almost like they're only reporting the serious ones. I'm going to look at those numbers again a little bit later on. All right, but let's go to the next one as follows. Uh, let's go to... to, 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 to Let's go to the states. Ready? Here we go. All right. Age mortality breakdown. Uh, looking at basically 85 or older, still the leading age category for mortality. At 193,000, uh, 75 to 84, 185,000. And then it drops off significantly between 45 and 54 and 55 and 64. As you can see right down the line. This is reporting to the CDC and the information information is basically being derived from the CDC itself. That's the that's their age groups. All right, then we go down to do, 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 do. Let's go look at Florida. It's an interesting data. Texas is still kind of high. You can see a little bit of an arch in new deaths per thousand between the states. Seems to be pretty synonymous, but then look at Florida. They're right there. And some states are barely touched, but, but however, though, you can see this, this little spike, then a drop. Some have not reached that drop yet. And most look like they're on the downward uh, downward trend. All right, and then we go to do, 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 do. Oh, this, I got this too close. This is of October 7th, the reporting new deaths per, uh, per 100,000. Right now, we're at 3.35, let's just say, mortality per 100,000. What do you think our mortality was at the very beginning? I think it was April compared to now. With all the medical technology and everything else that's being done, do you think our mortality is less or more than it was at the very beginning of the pandemic when we started keeping data? So we go this way, that's the full year. Let's go down. And remember, there could be reporting anomalies, but in the very beginning, mortality was 2.88. That's food for thought. Look at it as a whole. There it is, as far as, as data reporting has been done. All right, and then we go to, do, 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 this, look at Florida, California, it seems like those are really the states we pay attention to. Texas is quite up there. Uh, currently, as far as all of them, they're at 6.17 uh, deaths per 100,000. But there's Florida. Remember, Florida continued to fall off the edge of the earth there. But let's bring it downtown and see exactly how they're comparing as of today because when they're doing good, you don't hear that much about them. So let's just see. We get that weird drop that occurred right around here. And then it just dropped precipitously. And if we bring it to just the current amount, it's October 7th, the last day of reporting, 0.42 for Florida. California's got Florida beat by 0.35. And, but however, though, Florida is doing better than New York. I bet you don't hear about that in the media. Texas, though, Texas has got a, a barrage of other issues going on. Well, that could add confounding to its elevated rates. Yeah, so I'm not going to really rely too much on that as far as Texas, which is quite high. But however, though, Florida, 0.42. California, 0.35. New York, so you got 0.77. So you, with all lockdowns in New York and all the partying in Florida, Unless the data collection anomalies, Florida is doing better than New York. And that's just uh, to look at it as a whole. 
All right, and then we'll proceed with that. Let's go to the next one, the mutations. Here we go. Da da da, mutations. Come on, pump. All right, and we look at this. Come on, we can move here. Give it a second. There it is. Not seeing any correlation except total boosters per hundred to weekly ICU missions, which doesn't mean the boosters are causing people to go to the ICU. It could just mean that people in the ICU may be getting booster shots more often. You can see the confounding there. But no other solid confounding in a negative or positive way, either, either reference to any other form of vaccination whatsoever. And that's going to come to true light as we go down. All right. Globally, this is, again, correlation. People fully vaccinated per 100 and total cases per million. Correlation of 0.893999. You can see right there. Uh, people fully vaccinated correlated to new deaths smooth per million. You see right there. Then we go down. Keep in mind, on, let's just go to the line. Let's just show you the whole thing. And this is an easy way to do it as far as looking at those graphs. Here we go. Scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. Here we go. Do, do, do. Scrolling down. Eventually, gosh. See, the data keeps on changing so dramatically so often. And hang on one second. Put down and come back in a second. Hang on. Now I'm back. It's like we're constantly pulling and making new databases continuously. In fact, the dashboards of yesterday, I mean, as far as the beginning, are antiquated because they, they present data, but they're not presenting data which is pertinent to the to the um, current environment. So you're constantly making new uh, graphs, charts, or whatever it is, like on the variants that we had to make a few weeks ago, which we just started building because we're changing different things. In the beginning, we're also checking pandemic lockdown measure mitigation factors and so on and so forth. And then the vaccine comes out, and now we're following the vaccine and vaccine uh, variants of concern. Before, us, does masking work? Does masking not work? Does distancing work? Does distancing not work? So we're all following Sweden. And now the, the dynamic changes. So you're always making new databases. But here we are. This is based upon the vaccine amount. So 0 to 10 people per 100 vaccinated, 11 to 20, 21 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 100. But now I have to change this data, this up, uh, platform again and add the boosters as well so we can get a good idea of what works and what not doesn't work. All right, so here we are. Total cases per million. The countries with a population of 5 million above the human development index of 0.64 that have barely vaccinated their total cases per million are right there. That basically 22,593 versus the countries which are heavily vaccinated 60 to 100. Uh, at 74,467 deaths per million on the lower end, uh, 0.55 on the countries which are not really vaccinated, countries which are heavily vaccinated, 0.9. Again, you get this bell type curve, not a bell curve, you know, it's skewed, but you see what I mean. Um, re reproduction rate, if you're into that. Reproduction rate in the countries which are barely vaccinated, 0.75. On average, reproduction rate of countries which are heavily vaccinated, 60, uh, 60 people per 100 per se or greater, 0.93. And we dropped off the y-axis there. Again, I'm pulling these charts up as we're going along. And so I'm seeing it for the first time as long as well as you. And new cases moved per million, uh, 0 to 10. Uh, they're at 29.52 new cases per million. If I can't get that, no hover card pops up there. Compare it to people heavily vaccinated, 60 to 100 people, uh, 60 to 100 out of 100 vaccinated, there are 140 cases per million. And then I don't know where this middle thing right here, 40 to 49 is odd. I don't know why that seems to be some sort of threshold number. All right, and then to proceed down, variant trends. Deaths per million, which is going to compare Sweden, India, United States, because those are decent benchmarks. Deaths per million, USA, close to five. Positive rate, about, what would you say, 0.09. And 
and fully vaccinated, you get an idea there. Bring up the bar chart there. India, again, still the same. Uh, deaths per million, India. What are we at there? 0. 0.2. Remember the our world data chart I showed you earlier? Deaths per million, United States, 5. Deaths per million, India, 0. 0.2, we'll say. Positivity rate. Yeah, that's pretty long. That's right along the, the Y and the X. Looks like it's pretty much like a zero. I may have to make that line a little thinner. All right, and then fully vaccinated in India, first the population. Sweden, remember this is a, they're pretty well vaccinated, but again, this was a country which did not delve into the draconian lockdowns as other countries did, so to make a good sample. Deaths per million, 0.5. A uh, positivity rate about 0.03. Vaccination rate pretty high, but you compare that to the United States again. You know, what? Why? How did I mean? How does Sweden end up 0.5 compared to the United States at 0.5 or greater? And they have virtually had very little uh, pandemic uh, mitigation factors. They were resisting masking, distancing, and everything else. Yet the performance, regardless of the pundits, seems to be pretty interesting. And guess what? You don't hear about Sweden in the news anymore, do you? Remember those congressional hearings? Oh, they're Scandinavian. I have to keep it up proceeding. Da, 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 da. Right. Here's our variance. Not much to show you. It basically, the world is Delta. We have a, basically the last reporting is October, and you have a little bit of gamma in Brazil as far as. The, the most frequent one. I don't know where Alpha is. Where's Alpha? United Kingdom, 0.08. Mu, we have Mu on there. Mu is still around. Mu is in the United States at 0.09. It's interesting. Gamma, who's got Gamma? Oh, Gamma is Brazil at 7.5. And then Delta, pretty much there. And, and you really, I mean, you have a good selection here as far as different variants of concern, uh, but they tend to vanish as you head into October. Nowhere near uh, as interesting, as confusing as we go down the line and we still look at like May 17th. What was the primary one there? It was like Alpha? Yeah, it was Alpha. Where was Delta? Delta, there was Delta, and then all of a sudden, you could see where Nepal and uh, Vietnam, yeah, and so on and so forth in the line, and then it just basically, the viral pathogen replacement eventually overtook everything, and that was it. All right, and next week, what we'll do too, for those still with me at this point, um, I want to check into the uh, the uh, European database because I want to find out why I'm out there. And then this is my Twitter site. You can see how extremely boring that is right there. And uh, not exactly there. But if you look at the data we to pull up from other Twitter feeds, uh, you can read the data per se. And, and we're going to start pulling this up to get a – a uh, little bit of total information awareness. Some of these look like bots. And as I pull things up, I'm seeing a lot of retweets of the exact same thing over and over again, uh, multiple times. And I don't know why, especially if it uh, seems to be more towards the line of pro-vaccine. And, and that brings up a curiosity thing. And then what we'll do is we'll clean this up and... We'll break it down and we'll get a good sentiment analysis as far as what words are coming out there, so on and so forth. But let's cover everything we covered. Let's look at this. Do, 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 do. I'm going to web scrape, Europe, da, 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 mutations, cover, rebuild. All right. And we look at what we did. We looked at our databases per se. There's our disclaimer. We looked going backwards. Being affected at the first vaccine. Interesting. All right. We looked at the. Basically, the myocarditis after the first dose, 
cases are pretty rare. After the second dose, pretty solid jump. And so that's interesting uh, as far as the correlation. They say it requires further input. And this is not in the young. This is in the older, 18 and over. All right, and that's from the Journal of American Medical Association. Gut bacterium, all right, we looked at basically fecality bacterium being very, very, very positive. Parabacterioids, not. So again, the race of fecality bacterium seems to be a very, very promising one, and it's come up so much now. All right, then uh, the impact, we look at this. Of the COVID-19, as far as the beneficial bacteria in the, in the mouth, uh, makes you really wonder about how the masks affect the microbiome of the mouth. Uh, very strong correlations in reference to health and outcomes. Then we looked at the American Journal of Medicine commentary on COVID-19 vaccine should be shored up with plant-based diet. 73% lower odds. Pretty promising. Natural infection it produces immune reactions different than vaccine-induced infections. Very intriguing. The links will be there. As well as study questions, popular COVID uh, tests. People that are asymptomatic uh, with COVID-19 uh, may have been infected already. Just not know it because we're testing for the nucleo nucleocapsid protein and not the receptor binding domain. And then to finish off, UVC-222, as quoted one more time, and not to use the word kill, the virus is one of the easiest by far to inactivate with UV light. This virus is one of the easiest. So it would be really, 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 really cool if UVC-222 comes down in price and so it's been incorporated in public arenas where there's a question just to give people the element of being normal because this new no, new normal is not going to hold all right go all against once again thank you very much for watching tonight and tomorrow i'll do a little bit more with i'm not part but next week with the twitter and as always gratitude thank you to the researchers most of all and thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you all next time. Catch you then. Ralph signing out. Bye-bye.